of a 615 class. That you'll be meeting with the later section after the event tonight, and that's at 8 o'clock, I believe. Um, so grab food on the way out and then go to Dave's class at 8 o'clock, if you would, please. So good evening, everybody. I'm Michael Ulrich. I'm the director here at NYU Washington, D.C. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the Abramson Family Auditorium for tonight's event, Alumni Spotlight, Women in and of the World. Tonight's panel is part of the NYU Wasserman Center's Career Week programming, as well as NYU Washington, D.C.'s Women in and of the World program series. And we have a Wasserman guest here to welcome you as well. Hi, everyone. Um, I would like to echo um, our welcome to you and thank you to our panelists for coming and speaking with us today. My name is Sarah Rosenthal. I am an assistant director at the Wasserman Center for Career Development at New York University in New York. And I'm really thrilled to be here uh, to sponsor this event with uh, the Washington, D.C. site, as well as Women in and of the World. Um, at Wasserman, our mission is to make sure that we're providing NYU students and some alumni uh, on our panel, um, as well as all alumni around the world, with really comprehensive services and programs uh, to assist them in their career exploration and uh, job successes. So we accomplish this through a diverse array of programming, including resume and cover letter, um, reviews, interview prep, career fairs and expos, boot camps, uh, employer presentations, collaborative programs like this one, um, and doing uh, surveys to collect information on NYU graduates, where they're, they're headed after they graduate from NYU, as well as what current NYU students are doing, whether it's part-time jobs and internships like many of you have, uh, to find out more about the career-related activities that students are engaging with while they're at NYU. So ultimately, it's our empower to uh, it's our goal to empower NYU students and alumni uh, to succeed at every stage, whether it is as a first-year student or a seasoned professional. And I'm really excited to be hosting many other Career Week events later this week. Um, and so thank you once again to Michael, to the entire Washington, D.C. staff, and especially to our panelists for allowing me to be here today. A very warm welcome as well to our expert alumni that are here to discuss their international careers and offer advice to our students and young professionals around DC on how to prepare for success in an increasingly interconnected world. I'm also very thrilled to introduce you to our very own NY Washington DC student, James Pooler, who will be moderating tonight's discussion. James is a sophomore in the College of Arts and Sciences studying political science and philosophy. Last fall, James was nominated as an NYU Global Experience Scholar, and he's currently Program Manager of NYU DC Dialogues, a new student initiative which he will tell you about more in a few minutes. James is passionate about academia and cybersecurity, and hopefully moderating as well, and intends to pursue a career in diplomacy. Welcome, James. Thank you, Michael. Before we meet tonight's speakers, I'd like to say a few words about the initiative that Michael mentioned. Uh, tonight's discussion is special in that it is uh, part of three programs. First of all, the Wasserman Center Career Week, the Women in and of the World series, and this freshly established student-led initiative, NYU DC Dialogues. The DC Dialogues is a student-led initiative which is, was created to engage the NYU DC community in key discussions on politics, culture, business, art, and uh, much more. And unlike traditional panels, NYU DC Dialogues invite students to submit their topic proposals and invite speakers to come discuss things they truly care about. So for this event, the DC Dialogues Executive Board and the Wasserman Center convened with students to gather some of their questions, uh, which I think will be very interesting for everyone. And uh, that being said, I'm gonna let my panelists uh, open the floor and talk to us about their accomplishments, their career trajectory, and their affiliation with NYU. Starting from my left, Marjorie. Hi. Hi. How are you? <laughs> Great. Great. <laughs> um, thank you, everyone, for coming and for inviting me um, to be on this wonderful panel. Um, I, we've all been saying how a lot of us didn't even know that this was here, so I'm excited to to come back and be able to, you know, connect with more alum. 
Um, so my name is Marjuan Kennedy. Um, I'm originally from DC. Uh, I grew up here. My family um, is actually Caribbean from Trinidad and uh, my dad's African American. So I've had a very uh, unique uh, background in growing up. Um, traveled a lot through the Caribbean as a child and um, I attended Duke Ellington School of the Arts, which is a high school here. Um, and then I went on to Fordham to do my undergrad in theater and African studies. So I actually attended NYU and got my master's in art and public policy um, from the Tisch School, which I'm not sure if a lot of people are aware of the program. It was a, I think it was in its third year when I was there. Um, so it was a program that looked at the interconnectedness of art, uh, public policy, social justice, and how do all those things interconnect? Um, so for me, my background was in theater, in the performing arts, and I had a love of it. You know, I came to New York and wanted to be on music, you know, be on Broadway and do musical theater and have a career as an actor. Um, and you know, for me, it was kind of for a lot of artists, it's kind of a traditional um, career that you or untraditional. Um, but in my mind, I just you know, wanted to live in New York and kind of just go through the struggle, which I think a lot of artists in New York, you know, they go through. Um, but I decided to go to NYU because I had all of these <coughs> interests in college. Um, I, you know, I was an academic. I loved history. I loved studying anthropology and African studies. Um, but I also was an artist and, you know, I trained in theater. I studied theater in Russia for a couple months. So I was, I was kind of all over the place, which I think, you know, as students, you know, you, you do have a lot of interests. You are, you are inspired by a lot of different things. And sometimes it gets confusing to figure out, okay, I want to, I want to be a lawyer. I want to be in business. I want to, you know, how can, how can I do all of these things? So that was kind of where I was. So I was very excited when I heard about this program in the Tisch School. Um, I actually auditioned for the grad acting program, and I got in there too. So it was a it was a struggle for me to decide whether to go to grad acting at NYU or do this new program. So I went ahead and did this new program, and it was actually um, it was one of the best experiences I've ever had, um, really in my life. I it was a one year program, so it was very intense. It was. Um, a lot of work, a lot of, um, you know, academic, academically, but it pushed me artistically. Um, it challenged me to, to write and be more creative in producing and creating work, um, which I never really did before. Uh, one of my professors was Anna D. Avery Smith, who um, is, you know, a, an accomplished uh, playwright. Uh, actress and she was one of the main influencers for me in, um, in the next level of my career. So I pretty much you know took all of my interest and in that time in that one year um, you know I was very interested in feminism and you know African history, um, new, new experimental ways of performing and um, I decided to create a one-woman show during my time at NYU, kind of as my final thesis. And I never intended to, you know, make a full show. I just really wanted to do it to graduate and not write a paper. <laughs> so I ended up doing this play, and um, it, it just kind of took off. And I worked with a few of my friends at NYU, and we produced it. Kind of fast forward three or four years, I ended up doing it off-Broadway. I performed it at about 30 colleges, toured it all over the country, and the play was called Girls, 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 and it looked at um, the interconnectedness of the power of the media and how it affects young women. Um, and through, through satire, in the style of, if you guys are familiar with In Living Color, that type of hip hop type of um, aesthetic. So, it really got me thinking, you know, how, how I use my art to speak out um, on, on issues that young people, you know, face and even, you know, as a young woman, you know, 
growing up and in living in different areas in different cities, um, what is my voice and how do I how do I create art for meaning? So I think my time at NYU really shaped that and really formed that into what I do now. And what I do now, um, I have my own production company that is based in DC. Um, and we produce a variety <laughs> of works, um, live theater. Um, right now, I'm really focusing on uh, children's media. Um, I have a children's brand called Callaloo, which teaches little children about ages three to about 10 um, about culture and doing it through books, animation, um, television, live performance. And what we do is we go around to schools, festivals, we have digital content, and we create stories around folklore from different cultures. So um, I've been really focusing on that for the past three years or so. Um, as well as working with a lot of local artists here and young people I teach in the city, theater and um, arts in different ways. So um, I'm, I'm wor I work in a lot of different areas, but I think my time at NYU really allowed me to focus in on what I wanted to be doing, what I wanted to wake up and do every single day. And um, I think as an artist, you know, we, we kind of lead by passion. Mm -hmm. I knew I never wanted to you know, go to the same office every single day and sit behind a desk. I like to get out and work with people, work with young people. I love to be creative. So I'm happy you know, where I am. I'm mid-career, I'd say. So you're, um, not a, you're not really a nine to five person? Not at all. <laughs> not at all, which has been a struggle. Um, but I love what I do and I can say every morning you know, I think, you know, living in New York, you, you have that hustle mentality, especially if you stay there, uh, if you stay there afterwards. So um, I lived in New York for about seven, eight years, and then I moved out to L.A., and I was doing more film and television work um, there. And I found that, you know, I, I, I went out there to be an actress, and I found out that I really loved producing, and I loved being behind the scenes. Um, so, which is great for me. I, I, I realize I love writing. I love making stories come to life, whether they're in front of the camera, behind the camera. You know, I love, I love taking a great story and producing that. So, um, besides all of my other work in terms of film, I really am getting more into documentary film and um, really, really, I love being back home in DC and being able to work with artists here and young people for them to think of themselves not just as artists or just as students, but as entrepreneurs and how do we create, you know, a better community? How do we, how do we tell our story? So. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty, thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, it's pretty unique to be working, I guess, in the art scene. And from what I know, your uh, producing company tries to reconcile business and art. And I guess having that experience in New York and LA is a solid foundation to bring it all back here. Yeah, I mean, definitely New York and LA, they're different industries. Yeah. New York is more theater based and um, I prefer <laughs> the New York um, energy there and LA is more film uh, production. Mm -hmm. um, but it was great to have that experience, which I'm sure, you know, students that are here in DC, it is very different from New York, um, still city, but the energy is a little different. You know, what you, the people that you meet, mm -hmm. that you're exposed to, exposed to here, you know, it's different. So I, I really enjoyed that, you know, being able to travel and live in different cities to figure out what I really wanted to do. It helps. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, next we have Sharon Levine, who actually holds, mm -hmm. Levine, sorry, excuse me, who actually holds um, two degrees from NYU, JD at the New York uh, University School of Law and a Bachelor of Arts mm -hmm. in uh, Political Science and uh, Romance, Romance Languages. languages. Right. So I am originally from Kingston, Jamaica, so this is the Caribbean contingent. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm actually going to the Virgin Islands uh, in a couple of weeks. So uh, I knew three things in life. One was that I was going to study foreign languages, primarily French and Spanish. This was from high school. I was going to be in New York, come hell or high water, as they say. And I was going to NYU. And after that, I knew nothing else. So uh, I'm, I'm sure some of you find yourselves in, in, in that boat. Uh, 
I currently am what's called the director of the Office of Minority and Women Inclusion. It sounds like a mouthful, but it's a position that is, is mandated under Dodd-Frank. I mean, um, many of you have heard of Dodd-Frank, <coughs> hopefully. Uh, I am at the uh, Federal Housing Finance Agency, FHFA, not FHA. And what we do is regulate Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and what's called the Federal Home Loan Banks. Uh, they play pretty much in the secondary mortgage market, which in, in uh, very briefly, they don't make loans directly to, to borrowers. They actually partner with, uh, or I shouldn't say partner, they, they have relationships with lenders themselves who make loans to consumers and then Fannie, Freddie, and the banks will actually buy the loans, which is why it's called the secondary mortgage market. Mm -hmm. uh, I have practiced law for uh, this uh, technically 32 years. Um, so I've been at this for quite a while, even though in my current position, it's not a legal position, but I have to say that having the grounding in, in law uh, is imperative from the perspective of knowing what it is that we have to do because it is steeped in law it is, it is, it is broad, it is all-encompassing. Uh, I focus on the diversity and inclusion of our agency, which is a federal government agency, but I also oversee and supervise all the diversity and inclusion activities of all our regulated entities, and they manage $6 trillion of assets. So it is a, a bit overwhelming uh, at times, knowing the, the depth and breadth of, of what is involved, but I am, I'm enjoying it. I came here, my, my path wasn't quite linear, although a bit more linear than Marjuan's, uh, having studied uh, languages and political science. Um, I thought I wanted to do public administration uh, after graduating, but took a year to, to, to think that over and then ended up in law school. So I've practiced in a variety of settings, large law firms, in-house uh, 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 positions, um, and this is my first federal uh, government position. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's everything that I have done in my life has led to this point. Uh, you know, I find that, that life is, uh, is built on incrementalism um, you don't start knowing where you, well, some people do, but I certainly didn't. Uh, you don't start knowing exactly where you want to go, but each experience that you have, you build on that. And uh, even if it's a, a negative experience, it's a learning experience. And I find that everything that I have experienced to date brings to bear on what I'm currently doing. So that's my spiel. Thank you. Uh, as you may or may not know, a lot of our students here actually uh, are in the NYU Liberal Studies program. Mm -hmm. And uh, I actually, you majored uh, in Liberal Studies technically, Political Science and Romance Languages. Mm -hmm. So my question is, um, how relevant uh, was your undergraduate education to a career in, in, in government, uh, law, and related to somehow finance? Uh, it's, it's not directly relevant, obviously, it's, 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 but along the, the path of, of my profession, I have had the occasion to use my knowledge of French and Spanish in sort of the oddest ways. Uh, in, in one in-house position, for, for instance, um, the, uh, the company was doing some joint venture work mm -hmm. with a uh, Parisian company, and I was the only person in the company who knew French. Um, of course, having studied 17th century and 18th century French and French literature, it didn't really have much of a bearing on, uh, on, on corporate law, but I had studied them long enough and knew them well enough to be able to look at the documents, review them, and actually know what they were saying. Um, I've had the occasion in, uh, also in the financial services industry, to use Spanish uh, in looking at some of the environmental issues uh, in transactions that, uh, that we've had to do. Mm -hmm. So um, now in my position, I have a, uh, a, a, a 
very deep sense of, of the diversity of this country, the demographic trends that are, are taking hold uh, globally, really, and but especially in the US. Um, I understand, because having studied the cultures of not only uh, uh, French and Spanish, I also studied German and Latin. Um, and so I have a, a real deep sense of what it means to be a minority or what it means to be different, uh, which is, I, I, I think, where we're headed in the direction of diversity and inclusion. What does it mean to be different? And what is the value that is brought to the table by being different? So uh, th the value is you're, you're different and you bring value because of that diversity, um, not in spite of that diversity. So it's, it's had some indirect mm -hmm. influence, uh, if, if that makes sense to you. Yes, definitely. Um, I speak French myself, so right. I can relate to. <laughs> um, well, it's uh, fantastic to hear that your liberal studies education is uh, somewhat relevant, uh, certainly relevant to your career path. Um, the liberal studies program, I think, is very much embedded in the value, NYU's value of you know, global education. Um, so that's always reassuring to hear, great to hear. It, it also actually helped me to earn a living um, during college because I, when I, I uh, came from Jamaica, mm -hmm. I was on a student visa. Um, I got a work permit. I needed to make money. And so I was able to get a job in the School of uh, Technology and Industrial Education. I don't know if it still exists at NYU. It probably doesn't. <laughs> but as a trilingual typist, they were looking for three different people um, who could look at the, the curricula, in one in French, one in Spanish, and the other in Haitian Creole, which I didn't speak okay. in any event. I figured it out. <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> they gave me all three jobs. Of course, they didn't pay me more than the one person, right, but, yeah. uh, <laughs> 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 but it also helped me to earn a living along the way. So it's, it was yeah. very valuable. Thank you. Um, Next, we have Michelle Wyman, who's uh, the executive director of the National Council for Science and the Environment. Thank you. Um, it's, it's good to be here tonight. And, and please forgive, I've got my phone with me and it's buzzing a bit. Uh, I'll explain why in a minute, because I normally am not a fan of that. Um, let's see, where did I come from? I grew up in Texas, and I did not know what I wanted to be when I grew up at all. Um, and sometimes I still question if, I, if I've gotten clear on that answer. Um, let's see, for undergraduate, I went to the University of Texas at Austin and I graduated with a BS in journalism and a BA in German literature. And um, coming out of that, thought for sure that I, at that point, I thought, okay, I'm gonna be a foreign correspondent because I wanna travel. There's a lot going on at the time in Eastern Europe. Um, a lot of friends and people were going over there doing good work, particularly writers. And, and, and I thought that I could, I could affect change, work with people, um, get close to people that I admired through that work, and uh, be able to travel. Um, at the same time, while I was an undergraduate, I started working during the summers. So follow me on this because it, this is the absolute crookedest path. Um, and, and I say this with so much admiration for artists as a non-artist person. I, I, I should have, I should be an artist just based on my path, but I'm, I'm the very least type of person that could qualify as an artist. I'm way too literal. Um, but I started working during the summers as a park ranger at Grand Canyon National Park. And while I was there, I was a, a combination of an interpretive ranger on the geology staff and also because I was the only person that spoke French and German, um, able to entertain groups that were coming from overseas that didn't speak English and give them tours of Grand Canyon and the history. So what I didn't realize was this accidental process that was happening inside of me where I started to fall in love with the environment around me. And in, you know, so, so the, the outward facing part of me, the non-self-aware part of me was thinking, you know, I'm going to go, I'm going to be a foreign correspondent, it's going to be great, right up until the end. And right when I graduated, I realized, wait a minute, I'm actually not sure if this is what I want to do, um, so I'm going to take some time. And in doing that, I ended up taking a job in North Central Texas in a small local government. Um, called the city of Euless. It's kind of sandwiched in between Dallas and Fort Worth. 
At the time, there were 42,000 people living there. Um, and I took a position as a recycling coordinator. And the, the position was newly created as a result of a Senate mandate that was passed through states down to cities, not an uncommon thing. Local governments had to bear the cost. And it's really when the recycling movement started. Um, so I took that job and I did it for three years. And, and in a way, um, it did not feed the part of me that really had, had um, evolved so deeply when I was at Grand Canyon. On the other hand, it really helped me understand that at Grand Canyon, the people that came to the canyon were a willing audience. They were interested, they were there for a reason, they knew why they came. Um, the first city council meeting that I had where I had to present my budget and my program started with a council member raising their hand and saying to me, I just want you to know Miss Wyman, and I was 23 years old. Um, I did not support your position, and I'm not going to support your program. And this was in a public meeting. And so I realized that here I have, I have this evolving passion for the environment, and I also am passionate about people and about leaders and people that choose particularly to focus their leadership um, within the public sector and for the public good. And some of those people believe very differently from how I believe. And they have a public stage to do that. So I did that, that work for three years. And I kept looking across the pond. And I kept looking outside the borders, but across the, the, the literal pond, across the Atlantic, thinking, you know, if there are recycling programs in the world right now that we could learn from, Germany's got the most amazing program so far. Now remember, this was a really long time ago. I'll age myself at some point tonight, I'm sure. But for now, let's just pretend it was last year, sure. which it wasn't. <laughs> um, so I applied for a fellowship with a German foundation called the Bosch Stiftung. And, um, and it was a, a fellowship program called uh, Fellowship for New American Leaders. And I remember well, and I'm sharing this with all of you for a reason. I remember, and this is not for bragging, it's actually out of I'm still stunned that I was awarded this fellowship, and I'm extremely humble about it. Um, and I share with you the following. I got the application, and in no way did I fit any of the criteria, including a requirement of a graduate degree. Ideally, how is the language they always put in applications? Um, what would be ideal is a, is a law degree. I had undergraduate degrees, no graduate experience. Um, I had some work on the ground. And, and I was lucky enough to speak German, which is not a requirement, but another one of those, it would be ideal if. Um, my father said, you're dreaming. Don't waste your time. And my mom said, all the more reason. Go for it. You've never been, you've never been a circle that fits in a circle. Um, you're a circle that fits in a square, so go for it. And, and I still remember the day that the doorbell rang. And back then, FedEx wasn't so common. And there was a FedEx, and it came as an award, and, and there was this letter sitting in front of me, and it, and it was life-changing. I spent a year on this professional fellowship program, and it still exists. I encourage you all to explore it. Um, I basically was able to identify for the foundation the uh, areas where I wanted to spend internships for the course of nine months. It was a very well-paid professional fellowship, and because Bosch is, is a a really well-recognized company, not only internationally, but very specifically, it's a point of pride for Germans on the manufacturing side. Um, we could, as fellows, we could go and be placed in our internships at, at locations of our choosing. Um, again, circle in a square, rather than having two neat internships, one in the fall, one in the spring, what I proposed to the foundation was, well, now that you've said the sky's the limit, I'd like to spend the fall in the federal side with the environment ministry. And then I want to spend the spring spending four weeks at a series of regional governments, uh, local governments, and state governments within the country. And after they got done being exasperated, they helped me structure that. And the purpose for that was to really identify firsthand and understand why does recycling work so well in Germany and why is it so difficult over here? During the course of that experience, um, over and over and over again, I started to think, you know, I need, I need more education. And my passion for the environment was evolving further into a commitment to public service. Um, so I started looking at graduate programs, and when I read about NYU, 
and I went to the School of Public Administration, the Wagner School. Um, I just knew it was the perfect fit for me. I interviewed with a number of universities and um, again sat down with some of the, the leadership at Wagner and without question knew that it was the right fit for what I wanted to do in graduate school and for the flexibility that I needed by virtue of the fact that I'm, I'm a circle and a square still now. Um, I went through the program while I was there. I had the opportunity to work for someone at the UN um, and through that, ex through that experience and that internship, s worked with him um, with a focus on, on the Asian Pacific re region. And we wrote a handbook um, for Asian Pacific local governments on recycling, which in some ways I still find a little bit ironic because I don't know why I was a person who was contributing to a handbook for people to implement in places where I hadn't been yet. Um, but again, I share this with you because I think the level of exposure and access that you have when you're in New York and, and you have the campus as your base um, is, is an extraordinary asset. And my experience with NYU is um, it, it never hurt to ask and it never hurt to put forward a big idea. And, and you know, don't ask it once. If no is the answer, find a different professor, um, talk to a different group of students, see if it might still be possible if your passion is behind it that, that you can usually find support. Doing good and doing well ends up finding um, a rich audience. It just is a matter of finding the right fit. Um, after I graduated, I uh, came to DC and worked very briefly for a law firm here. Again, circle and square, I'll just keep saying it. I was um, one of the first non-lawyer partners to establish a practice. The practice was focused um, on proactive environmental work with local governments. In other words, um, helping them put together a sustainability plan for their city or their county, and then being able to use that plan as a proactive way to be responsive to a compliance issue um, with the Clean Air Act, for example. So to be able to help local governments understand there's a lot of value in proactive, forward-thinking environmental work, it can serve you in many ways. Um, shortly after I got here, I fell in love with somebody who lived in California, so I moved over to the West Coast. And the best part about that was, when I was at NYU, I found this nonprofit organization that, to me, represented everything from mission to membership that I wanted to be a part of. Um, it's called ICLE, uh, terrible acronym. The, acr the acronym stands for the International Council for Local Environmental Initiatives. Um, it's now a body of, I don't know, I think 15 offices globally. Um, I had the privilege of serving as the executive director of the U.S. office for six years. Through that, during that time, I learned how to raise money with federal agencies. Um, with support from USAID, we opened offices in Delhi, um, in, let's say, South Africa, in Brazil and in the Philippines. So I was able to then really start to deepen my international work. Um, and, and all of it kind of advancing this priority that I had that tracked all the way back to Grand Canyon, which was helping cultivate a value for natural resources and to do that without compromising people's ability to earn a living and to live, but to live in complement with the earth. Um, since then, I. Uh, my goodness, I'll quit talking soon. I've had uh, turns at the federal government. I served most recently as the Director of Intergovernmental Affairs at the Department of Energy under our current Secretary, Secretary Moniz, an unbelievably brilliant individual, and, and it was an extraordinary experience. I most recently have taken on the role as um, the Executive Director with, with this organization, and the mission of this organization in many ways, like your experience, it, it represents a culmination of everything that I've done. Um, the mission is to improve environmental policy making and decision making through science. It's an impartial organization which is important in this day and age. Um, it's impartial and hopefully a safe place where we can marry scientists with policy makers and help them have conversations that are constructive and again proactive. Um, I'll stop there. Thank you. It seems that NYU Wagner really played a role in reconciling your various interests, and it's always fantastic to hear that NYU is a perfect fit Absolutely. Uh, in your career trajectory. And um, that being said, it is one of the top programs in, in public policy. And 
in your what um, and it is also, it's also notorious for ha uh, offering great uh, leadership skills. And if anything, how have the sk leadership skills you've acquired there helped you uh, advance forward in your career and also define uh, what it is that you ended up doing? Oh, gosh, in a number of ways. Um, the program itself that I was in, we, we did a lot of public speaking you mm -hmm. know, within the classroom. Um, I also had, had fantastic mentors. Sadly, my, my advisor, um, Dennis Smith passed away this past year, um, but he, he was I an extraordinary influencer and took me by the hand more than once and, and kind of gave me, gave me a, good, a good motivational speech when I was nervous. A lot of the work that I was able to do at the UN, um, which happens often here in D.C. too, y you're placed in positions that, that aren't necessarily what you're prepared for, but they're extraordinary opportunities. Um, and, and over and over, Dennis would grab me by the hand and say, you're good, you got this, and give me talking points. He, he taught me how to write my first speech. Um, he made me write one for him. Uh, and I, I think in so many different ways that I hadn't anticipated uh, being at NYU and being in the city where the campus is located also, it's, you know, you learn how to, how to, how to operate on your own and, and be self-sustaining pretty quickly. Great, thank you for your insight. Uh, we're going to move on to Dr. Amy Zalman, who holds a PhD in Middle Eastern Studies from the Graduate School of Arts and Science, and is the, the director of, of the Council for Emerging National Security Affairs. Yes and no, I'm on the board. You're I'm on the a board, board director of that nonprofit. Um, I just, I wanna say that I'm increasingly feeling like I'm an incredibly privileged company. Um, this is a really, I don't know how many panels you've sat in front of where people are telling their careers, but um, not only is everyone here really talented, but also um, it's rare to get the really the real story yeah. of how people arrive sure. at their positions, and I find it very um, comforting because I thought it was just me. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I thought a career was you know, something that if you were so lucky as to go to a cocktail party and somebody said, what do you do? You could answer in like one to three words. And I've never <laughs> been able to, so I feel like <laughs> it makes sense. Um, yes, I went to NYU um, following a master's of fine arts in poetry from another um, New York school um, to get a PhD in Arabic literature. I mean, I did it because I wanted somebody else to pay for travel. <laughs> um, which they did, and when I got out Jordan, I was thinking that having spent sort of a winter in Jordan, I remember thinking that if I had done Caribbean studies, I would have been sort of better off because <laughs> it snows there. <laughs> um, I, had, I had a good time at NYU. A couple of the things that stand out for me were the mentorship of the person who was the dean, Kate Stimson, for some years, um, and efforts that I made at that time, I was very briefly the president of the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences Council to bring together career services and the private sector better on behalf of graduate students because I didn't think we would all go on to academic careers. Um, and so now it looks like those 20, so many years later, a little bit over a decade, um, that the, that is really sort of unfolding um, in ways that it wasn't um, 10, 15 years ago. Um, what I knew at the end of my graduate study was that I wanted to do something international and global. I had already been engaged. I had spent some time in the Middle East um, and took advantage of, of um, various uh, fellowships and so forth um, that I wanted it to do with writing. I felt myself and still do to be a writer and that I sort of liked something vaguely called strategy um, and that I didn't want at that to teach. I had done a lot of teaching um, for the last decade almost at that point. So I thought I'll open an international consultancy, which was awesome, except for I had no business experience, um, whatever, um, and sort of academic parents. But um, I did. I thought uh, with a business partner that um, at some point businesses would discover that the Middle East had markets, that people needed shoelaces and um, uh, you know, CDs and, and all the things, pharmaceuticals, all the things we need. Um, I opened it with no um, connection whatever uh, in the years just after the 
attacks on September 11th and just um, in the run up to the war in Iraq. And as a result, um, there were no businesses uh, going into the Middle East. The idea was a consultancy that would help sort of international um, projects and managers and those expanding do so with some cultural grace. Um, so what happened instead is that my company became a military subcontractor and I became acquainted with Washington at a very um, strange time. Um, and um, sorry, I'm thinking of going from New York to Washington and this experience. So I spent um, some months kind of sitting in rooms in that particular moment in our history with like military intelligence guys and like advertising firms and people who had just learned a few words in Arabic and all kinds of sorts sort of going in and out of rooms, um, uh, deciding how we should communicate with all of these foreign audiences that we uh, suddenly discovered we thought did not like us for a variety of reasons, um, whoever us was and whoever they was and so forth. Um, so I did that, um, and I got distressed about it in a variety of ways. And I sort of remembered that I had a degree in literature, and I wrote a paper, because I thought I was a writer, about how we could think about narratives and narrative theory, um, and how that might help us think about our national strategic communications in a different way. And I showed it to someone, and I showed it to someone else, which is the sort of accidental, nice, not messy part when careers work. And they said, well, why don't you come to this um, thing in Monterey and there'll be some defense people there and there'll be some state people there and I shared it with them and we started to have a talk about narrative which is now, um, I mean for, for various reasons but I think that I'm a tiny part of that, one of the ways that we talk about um, engagement um, in, in, our, in our global strategic communications. So after a while it turned out my business was not going to work beyond that, that way that it had um, as a military subcontractor. So I closed it and needed a job, and somebody said, could you, you could move to Washington and you could work in one of the big contractors here, um, which has since done all kinds of things, but it was called Science Applications International Corporation. So I came, and I did, um, and somebody put a proposal in front of me and said, well, we, we never get these, but why don't you write a contract? And I did, and I, I did things. I did strategic communications projects for intelligence and defense clients. Um, and on the side, I just kept, um, kept talking about engagement and communication. And I, um, that brought me into the world beyond um, Virginia a little bit as well. I went to NATO. I went to Congress. I went to um, various thises and thats. Um, and it turned into kind of a cottage career on the side, which I think is one way that sort of careers evolve um, or, or take those little steps forward. Um, and at a moment when I knew that I wanted to leave and didn't really want to be working in that company, I had the right dinner with the right friend on the right night. And they said that the National Defense University could be something that develop a, a professorship maybe um, at the National War College, which maybe some of you are familiar with. It's where um, State Department and military officials and other folks in the civilian um, government as well as foreign officers go when they have reached a certain level of seniority um, and may be promoted to flag officer or strategic levels. So they go there and they get a master's degree in strategy for a year. Um, and they opened up this uh, incredible position called Chair of Information Integration um, on the faculty of the National War College and it became my job to, um, to sort of sell information as an element of national power um, inside that curriculum where we know how to do diplomacy and we know really well how to do um, shooting, but we don't know so well how to work with this amorphous thing called information. And after doing that for a couple of years, I thought that teaching strategy was, um, was really interesting, but I sort of got the itch to lead something myself um, and I kind of so I went looking for a place to lead something, and I found a position as the CEO and president of a very long-standing organization, 50 years old, called the World Future Society, this amazing, crazy, global membership organization for futurists who are um, 
and I did that for a couple of years, I think, and that also brought me into the world. As it happens, um, the organization, I'm very proud of what happened in the last couple of years. They either get bigger or they get uh, they get nothing. So ours, when I took it, was on the road to becoming nothing, and it is now, I think, going to flourish. Um, I brought in some funding. I brought in a new chair of the board, and for a variety of reasons, I thought that it was prudent for that organization to do that without me. So as of a few weeks ago, I'm now where maybe some of you are, <laughs> which is thinking again about. Um, Wow, how do I write the bio anew? And what's the story that I tell now that leads exactly to the next thing? And how do you keep unfolding that? Um, I'm working on a, a book about futurists who are an interesting, amazing global tribe of their own. Um, uh, and thinking about what to do next, which might be my Thank you. Um, <coughs> you mentioned that a highlight of your time at NYU was uh, your mentor. And as you, uh, as you may or may not know, NYU DC has a very well-established uh, alumni mentor program. And uh, that being said, how would you say, how instrumental was this person to your uh, creating your story uh, and perhaps how, uh, propelling you into the right environment to start off your career? Um, and this, is, this question is open to, to anyone, really. Yeah, I don't know that she, I mean, she would have supported any career that I went into. She was, um, she was extraordinary. I think mm -hmm. she did for, for NYU. Um, she did a few things. She, she at least said on the outside she believed in me. She looked at work that I brought. She made herself available at a time when she, you know, to me, she was somebody really extremely important at the end of a very large room with a desk. And when I went there, she sat down and had coffee with me. That was extremely important. Mm -hmm. um, and um, she had ideas for me when I didn't know exactly where to go or what move to make next. Even in, not in my in the not in the. The, the deepest level of my academic stuff because that wasn't hers, but at, a, at actually a more important sort of strategic level for me as a graduate student, I think she did all those things. Um, but there was some, and she was a model. Anyone else care to answer that question? Or? Yes. I have an experience with um, the chair of the Art and Public Policy Department who recently passed um, this last year actually, Randy Martin, and um, one of the things that he had us do in our arts politics class, I mean, he was really a philosopher <laughs> at heart, um, but I just always remember, you know, these blackboards with all these equations, and I mean, this is about art, you would think we were in, <laughs> you know, like a chemistry class or something, um, but he had one exercise that he always used to talk with me about specifically. Um, he had all the artists, you know, we are artists activists at heart. And um, he had us do an exercise where, you know, write down the, the, the best, the biggest dream you have as an artist, what you could create. What would, be, what would that be if you could create one thing? And, you know, I don't remember what it was, but, you know, I wrote it down and he said, write it down in detail, you know, where will it play, who's the audience, you know, who's going to be there, what's the lights look like, the costumes, everything, what would it be? So um, I wrote this down in my journal and I still have it. And then, so this is on one side what my dreams are. And then the other side it was, why haven't I done it yet? And it was all of these things that I wrote down, you know, why I haven't done it. It's, oh, I don't have the money, oh, I don't know how to do it. You know, all of these things, but the point of that one exercise that I remember, it, especially as artists or even, you know, you know, young people, you know, we have all these dreams. We say, you know, when we're five years old, we want to be an astronaut or we, we know what we want to do. But then as we get older, it's kind of like, oh, wait, I can't do that. Or wait, I don't have the money to do that. Oh, wait, I don't have a degree to do that. 
and that that professor he he kind of just knocked that out for me that even now whenever you know I have an idea I still do that same thing you know <laughs> this is what I want to do I want to make a film and I want to do it here and these are the people that I need and so I never write oh I can't do it I'll write okay I need to get a cameraman I need to get funding <laughs> these are this is what I need to make this happen which I think whenever I work with young people and artists I always I always do that same lesson you know it's it's not about telling yourself oh I can't do it but how do I how do I get all of the things that I need to make that happen um, so yeah I mean Randy was one of the main influencers at NYU that kind of got me got my gears thinking more um, not just about you know being an artist or putting up you know a play but how do I bring people together? How do I get the resources I need? And, and making you know, my, my mind mm -hmm. think more business like. Yeah. And to have it click together. Yes. <laughs> Last but not least, Liv Log, pleasure to have you here. Uh, you have a Bachelor of Arts in Politics and Economics from the College of Arts and Science. I do, I do. My name is Libby Lock. Um, thanks everyone, thank you James and, and the entire staff here at NYU and DC uh, for hosting this panel. Um, so I am a defamation lawyer. What does that mean? I sue the media for a living. Um, <laughs> uh, and the defamation business is booming these days. Um, my path to <laughs> my path to uh, to where I I am now was was probably the most linear of of the, the these accomplished ladies on the stage. I grew up in Atlanta, Georgia, um, and I knew from a very young age that I wanted to be a lawyer and I wanted to go to law school. I think it was probably too many episodes episodes of L.A. Law. <laughs> now I'm dating myself. <laughs> Um, and, uh, and law and order uh, and wanting to be, have those dramatic moments in the courtroom. And so I uh, started my legal career uh, even before I got to NYU. I, um, as a junior in high school, I decided that I wanted to leave and go to college a little bit early. And so I went to the U.S. News and World Report ranking list. and went and found applications for all of the top schools and went through them diligently to figure out which schools would admit students after their junior year of high school. And I got down on the list to NYU and they were the, the, the highest ranked school that allowed students to apply after their junior year. And I applied and lo and behold, I got in and I ended up skipping my senior year of high school and moving to New York City when I was 17 years old. Um, and spent four years in the village uh, and loving every minute of it. I had, uh, I uh, have, as James mentioned, a degree in politics and economics. I, um, I think the, the mentorship question is a, is a good one. I had a lot of really wonderful mentors uh, in my professors at NYU, both in the politics and the economics department. And, uh, a lot of support uh, through pursuing internships. I was an intern here on uh, the Senate side of Congress uh, between my junior and senior year, and my, my politics professors really encouraged me to come to Washington and study and, and uh, be here. And that's where I got my first taste of the media, is working for then the late Senator uh, Daniel Patrick Moynihan as an intern. And I would, uh, one of my jobs as an intern was to pick press clippings and put them together and work with one of the staffers to put them together for the, the press clippings for the senator to read an abbreviated, basically an abbreviated version of the newspaper in the morning. And, um, you know, it was, it was always interesting, especially when you're on Capitol Hill and you see the news being made uh, throughout the course of the summer and you see the difference between what actually happens and then how it gets reported. Mm -hmm. And so it really was my first introduction to the media and, and my interest in it. Um, after NYU, I worked briefly for a year at a large law firm in New York City um, and applied and uh, was accepted to Georgetown University Law School. Um, my, my love for DC sort of flourished when I was doing my internship at, from 
uh, while I was at NYU, and I came back to D.C. and studied law for three years at Georgetown, and then worked for a federal judge for a year, and went on to work in a big law firm here in Washington, D.C. And while I was here, um, found another mentor uh, who took me under his wing and uh, introduced me to his practice, which was a media practice. He um, uh, he sued the media. Um, it was uh, my law firm. It was a big global law firm with I think they had like something like two thousand lawyers globally. Um, one of the was one of the very few large law firms that would actually be adverse to the media as opposed to representing corporation media corporations um, and doing the defense side of media work and um, got to know the practice but felt uh, I was there at this law firm for eight or nine years um, and uh, made partner at this law firm but felt that I fell in love with this practice it's, it's an interesting, I like to say it's a perfect intersection of law, media, and politics. Because every, every story in every case always has some political bent to it. Um, and, uh, and oftentimes the media has a, an agenda when they're publishing the story and the, the, the point that they're trying to convey to their readers. Um, but going back to this law firm, there for eight or nine years, um, it was increasingly becoming difficult to pursue this practice at this large law firm where I didn't have flexibility to charge clients different rates. Um, there were a lot of conflicts. A partner in our Shanghai office would have done a deal for an affiliate of News Corp, and then I could no longer send a nasty lawyer letter to the Wall Street Journal. Um, and so uh, my mentor and I went out and we started our own law firm about two years ago. Um, and we have now what is now a global practice, it's, uh, mostly national, but we do have some international clients. We currently represent the Dean of Students of UVA, who was unfairly attacked by Rolling Stone in the gang rape article. Um, we were the first uh, to file a lawsuit against Rolling Stone, um, and that is progressing through litigation right now. Um, it's going to be a very interesting case. It's set to go to trial in October, and you know it's a it's an interesting uh, it's an interesting area because you know we hear a lot about and read a lot about the balance of power between the government, large corporations, uh, and and who really holds the power in America, but we hear less about who holds uh, who checks the media's power. Who is there to protect and defend corporations or individuals when the media gets it wrong? In an age of social media and the internet and 24-hour news cycles, what happens when you are unfairly targeted and false and negative things are written about you and a story goes viral in a matter of minutes? And so that's, that's what I do. Thank you. Yeah, it's de it seems to be definitely an interesting field, especially you know that media's uh, 24 hours news cycles even more accessible than ever before, um, and also how it, especially we see it here in D.C., how it really defines the balance of power, who has the largest, uh, you know, most important voice in the media. I think we've all noticed that Donald Trump is relatively <laughs> popular uh, on CNN and whatnot, and. Um, Kind of just to stay in, in what you're working in, and you mentioned the, the UVA affair, which uh, I think we are all aware of, uh, more or less. Um, what other, uh, what do you think was the biggest case of defamation in, in Washington, D.C., in the media? I think the Rolling Stone uh, case was probably the biggest journalistic debacle in the last decade. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, uh, it's... It has come out now that Rolling Stone relied primarily on a single source for their story, um, who it appears fabricated uh, a story of gang rape, um, and through um, through failure to uh, fact check and get uh, secondary sources for this report, um, tarnished an entire institution and, and really harmed the lives of many individuals. My client, um, her name is uh, Nicola Ramo, um, got hundreds of emails with death threats. Things like, things saying, 
Um, I hope you have a daughter and she's raped one day. Um, I mean, some really awful things with the way the media has this power to portray someone, um, someone in such a negative light. And how does a dean of students at the University of Virginia fight back? She doesn't have the same mega megaphone that Rolling Stone magazine does. And so I think that I think probably the Rolling Stone um, piece was the biggest, the biggest one in recent in recent memory. Mm. Thank you. Well, we definitely have a really broad spectrum of uh, international experience here, and uh, a, lot, a lot of students who are here are also here for the, for the international experience working in um, multinational institutions here in D.C. And uh, what, um, what has been your experience really working globally and for uh, young alumni and current students, what would be a, a, you know, a piece of advice, a recommendation you would make? I can say um, with, with my practice, uh, protecting your reputation is, um, is increasingly difficult to do. And my biggest piece of advice is um, the internet is, is, <laughs> is you, you can never remove something from the internet. And so for students, I'm glad I did not go to college in the Facebook era, uh, <laughs> you know, and the cell phone camera era, um, you know, just I would be very mindful and you have to be very careful of your surroundings and how you present yourself to an increasingly um, accessible world. Um, privacy is, is, is at a premium these days and even when you're in a what you think is a safe environment, cell phone cameras and, um, and things that you say or things that you can do can be published. And it doesn't take the mainstream media to do that anymore. It takes someone um, with some bad judgment to post something on Facebook. And your reputation can be tarnished, and it can influence your career for years and years to come. So my biggest piece of advice is be very cautious about social media and what you put on social media. Any other insight on tips for a global career and what mistakes or things to do? Go places. Yeah. Go places. <laughs> yeah. If you can, go. You know, touch. Go to the actual place. I. Yeah. When I went to work at SAIC in Virginia, I said, "So, is there travel in this job?" And they said, "No, we can. You know, we have Google." <laughs> um, and <laughs> having had the experience actually from NYU, you know, from life and from NYU of traveling, I knew that it was not the same. And I actually think that that probably in the, some of the things that you're doing, that makes all the difference. If there had been public officials who knew if in the arena of global affairs, of which is not just foreign affairs and you know, um, trade and so forth, if somebody has had the experience at some point of being elsewhere, um, I think it probably changes the way that they do their work. So. So get on a plane. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I'll, I'll just add to it. I, you know, the, the time that I spent abroad as a professional, um, it, it formed, it informed and inspired going to NYU. And, and it really helped form an entirely different perspective about environmental policy domestically because I experienced it on the ground in a different country. Um, I couldn't agree more. Go places, and, and there's 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 nothing digital that is like being able to put your feet on the soil of a different country and talk to people and eat their food and spend time with them. Right, but when you do that, approach it with a very open mind mm -hmm. and not be judgmental. I, I can tell you, coming from one country and thinking and having a certain mindset, which was altered entirely when I came to this country and fit in different categories. And so just the difference is, is night and day between having that closed mind and that open mind. And, and try to listen. Very few people listen. And it's, it's an art that needs to be cultivated. We, we all like to speak and, and be heard. But, but try to listen. You pick up a lot more. Thank you. And well, you made a fine point on you know listening and being open, obviously. But uh, 
in your experience, what have been some challenges in working with very diverse communities and possibly abroad? So, w well, working with, uh, well, I can speak to uh, the financial services industry, mm -hmm. let, me, let me say. Um, uh, language is a barrier because diverse communi communities don't necessarily speak English and um, even though we have a significant uh, uh, Latin population for Hispanic population, for instance, not everything is available in Spanish. Uh, the, uh, it, it's in English, but not necessarily in, in Spanish. So um, trying to, to in, in the context of, of uh, mortgage financing, uh, let's say, what we're trying to do is to increase access for more borrowers, borrowers from diverse backgrounds, to be able to, to get mortgages, to be able to, to buy homes. And when you, you don't, when they don't understand the, the, the English documents, or when we and our regulated entities don't understand the, um, the, the, the cultural norms and how different uh, demographic groups behave, then they're not able to design and develop certain mortgage products, for instance, that can facilitate that increased access. So it's, it's a dynamic that has real implications for, um, for people uh, who live in this country. So a lot of minorities, immigrants, and, and um, generally sort of lower income folks. It has that's a, a, just a huge challenge that you know, we're constantly trying to um, to deal with on a daily basis. Not a challenge, but I mean, one of the things that's l potentially can happen um, when you go abroad, and I'm sure people in this room have experienced it, is that you become an unintentional ambassador, um, which is an interesting mm -hmm. position to be in. And I don't know if you have had this, or you have been a, probably a bilateral ambassador for um, much of your life, but I mean, it, it, it's just an, it's an interesting position to be in and one that is in certain ways a privilege if you have that opportunity, but also one that you can blow. Hmm. <laughs> um, and you may or may not think that you are an ambassador of what other people think you are an ambassador of. <laughs> right. Okay, well, <coughs> we're uh, soon going to be wrapping up, so I'm going to ask uh, perhaps the least original question in the book, <laughs> uh, but one that is often very reassuring. If there was one piece of advice you'd give your younger self, your college self, sitting in the audience right now, what would it be? I can easily say, <laughs> go after challenges. Don't make your lives easy. And that sounds counterintuitive, but un unless you feel a certain level of discomfort, you're not growing. And if you if you do want to grow, then it's imperative that you you recognize and you admit to yourself that you don't know everything, and it's perfectly fine not to know everything because no one knows everything. And it's it's hard. Um, it's especially as, as a lawyer, you get to a certain point where you think, oh my, I don't know enough, and I hate admitting that I, I don't know enough. But there's a certain point when you're a lawyer that you, you realize, it's okay, I know exactly what I don't know, and it's perfectly fine. You can attest to that, right? So, um, but I would say, accept the hardest challenges that you can, because you will be better off for it. Yeah, I second that. Um, I recently read Sheryl Sandberg's book, Lean In, mm -hmm. and I think you know this is a women's panel, and so I'll speak to the women in the audience. Um, I think it's a terrific book. If you haven't read it, you should, especially as, uh, as, as you are aspiring career women. Um, to be your own best advocate. Don't wait to find the perfect mentor to be your advocate. Um, and even though uh, you may not know <laughs> everything. Try to lean into those challenges and reach beyond, uh, like your story, reach beyond 
Uh, even if you only qualify for four of the ten criteria to apply for a job, apply for it. What's the worst that's going to happen? Mm -hmm. And don't take a step back um, to your male, male counterparts. Fake it until you make it. And have, <laughs> that's what my mom always told me. Fake it until you make it. Because um, that's what the boys do. And, <laughs> uh, and so that's my biggest piece of advice. There were too many times in my career as a young, as a young lawyer where I let my male counterparts sort of take the credit uh, because I wanted to be a team player and, and they will, and you have to be your own best advocate. And that's not, not just the boys, anyone, anyone. <laughs> just make sure that you're your own best advocate, even with other girls in the room. <laughs> you know, I would, I would give that, um, I've had an opportunity to work with a lot of elected officials in, in my career, and um, I mentioned earlier that I wouldn't normally bring my phone up here. I haven't done that before, so I'm pretty embarrassed about it. Um, but today we, we, we announced something through the work that I do. Uh, it was a bipartisan announcement by a group of 17 governors making a voluntary statement on clean energy. And, and part of the origination of that leadership initiative, and you'll see it in the news, hopefully, um, it's already <laughs> been tracking on, on social media and some headlines during the day. Hopefully reported uh, fairly. And so far, <laughs> so far, but I will tell you, I got a couple of them coming after me. Um, if you have but problems, is, let me know. Okay, okay. thank you. But, you know, it's, it's, it's history making um, in all seriousness because we have four Republican governors and we have 13 Democratic governors that stood up today uh, without a regulatory imperative. And, and we had planned this before the sad news of Justice Scalia's passing this weekend. We planned this before the Supreme Court ruling came out on the Clean Power Plan last mm -hmm. week. Um, and despite the things that have occurred, the governors chose to go forward. And the point that I want to leave you with from my perspective that I would have told my younger self is something that I ask elected officials every time I have the privilege of sitting down with one of them, whether it's a mayor, a prime minister, a governor, as I say, what do you want your legacy to be? Why did you run for office? What do you want to be remembered for? And I wish I had asked myself that. Not to be famous, who, you know, what will other people know me for? That doesn't matter. What do you want your legacy to be for yourself? And I really wish I had asked myself that before, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. So. I, I encourage you to, to carry that with you and give it thought over time and revisit it. I think for me, I, I agree with what everyone has said, um, but I remember being at NYU and even in college, like very active. I applied to everything. I probably didn't qualify <laughs> for a lot of things, but I still applied. I, I was always you know, involved and I was always active. Um, but I think if I could tell myself, my NYU self, um, when I was 23, I would say, be patient and keep moving. Mm -hmm. And I think because we live in this instant access, social media, you know, online land now, um, we want everything to happen so quickly. You think when you get out of school, you know, you're going to have the best job, you know, you're going to become a lawyer e immediately, you're going to be a partner immediately, you know, you're, you're going to find your husband, your wife immediately, and it might happen, but it may not, and what do you do in that space when it's not happening, and I think for myself, like, I've been able to keep moving, and a lot of, you know, my friends or, you know, artist friends especially, they always ask me that, you're always doing something. How do you keep moving? And I think it's because really getting out of school, I've been practicing patience. And patience in a lot of areas in my life, not just my career, but with relationships, with you know, spirituality, and you know, I, I, I originally just wanted to be an actor. I just wanted to be a performer. But now, you know, I'm an educator. I'm a business owner. I'm you know, so many other things. I'm a director. 
I'm a writer. A lot of things that I never thought that this was a passion or I could even make a living at this, but it means something more to me. You know, when I meet little kids and they ask me, oh, this is what you do for a job? This is, this is a job? Wow. <laughs> you know, and I think yeah. about that, like my yeah. legacy, like I can, I can change someone's mind. You know, it may not be reflected just yet with, you know, financially or, you know, what I have materialistic, you know, in materials, but that patience, you know, it's coming, it's coming. And you tell yourself it's coming. And I think sometimes as, you know, getting out of school, you, you want it to just be there. I got a degree, so that means that I can do it. It takes some time. You got you to gotta grind on the pavement and prove that you're worthy to be in the office. You're, you're worthy to be in front of people. And sometimes we forget that. Even now, I'm still out there. I'm still, what's the next thing? So patience. <laughs> Keep looking forward. Yes, yeah. keep moving. Yeah. All right, well, thank you so much for coming. It was really great hearing your diverse perspectives and from coming, ranging from all these fields you're invested in. A warm round of applause would be lovely. Thank you so much. <laughs> and I guess that now we're going to op open the floor for questions from the audience. Okay. Hi, um, I'm Rebecca. I am currently interning at the Women's Foreign Policy Group, which is an international group that works to uplift the voices of women um, in leadership, both politically and around the world. So I was really intrigued by everything that you all had to say today. Um, and right now, sort of in this framework of moving forward, um, I'm a junior, so I'm definitely looking towards the future. And I'm also looking for a little bit of a break <laughs> and for a moment to like kind of clarify exactly what is my next step. Um, so I guess if any of you have any advice or recommendations about what to do with, with time after college and whether or not to move right on to the next thing, whether that's grad school or law school, or if it's really worthwhile to take a year or two to, to spend some time exploring other options. Or three or four. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> It absolutely is worth it to take the time. I, I would strongly recommend not going straight into grad school because it's you, you, it's, you, you bring a lot to the table with your own experiences. So in a classroom, it's um, you know what the teacher has to impart to you, what other students have to impart, and I think the more experiences that, that graduate students have to share with the, the larger group, that it becomes a much more productive uh, environment. So three or four or five years. Can we yeah. add to that? I mean, we know that the, the, the nature of how we work is changing. So you may get a degree in three years, and you may get another in 15 mm -hmm. or not get any. Um, I mean, what's extraordinary is I feel like we've all been a bit in the gig economy before it existed, but um, it, things may not be so sequential um, right. mm -hmm. in the future because of drivers that are external even to your own drive. So um, it's always possible at this point. Th those um, trajectories. Mm -hmm are more easily mixed up, I think, than they might have been in the past without, um, without anybody condemning them or it not working. Yeah, I agree completely. Graduate schools are not going away. They will be there. Um, your youth, however, and your ability to take this time, um, your career, you, you have the rest of your life to build your career. You don't have the rest of your life to go to travel Europe or to go get on that airplane um, and you know be a broke, starving artist for the first <laughs> few years after after college. And um, I, I took a year off between undergraduate and and law school, and I wish I had taken more. I wish I had taken more. It was it was really truly one of one of the best years of my life living 
as a, as a single woman in New York City, um, just experiencing all that the city had to offer in a, in a menial job, <laughs> and, but, but, but with freedom. I mean, it was really incredible. It also, when you take time and um, have different experiences, it, it, it gives you the insight into not necessarily what you want to do, but what you don't want to do. And I think that is equally sure. important, knowing what it is that you could just never do. <laughs> and so I took a year between college and law school and actually worked for a cruise line. You know, I was no Julie, but I, I was... <laughs> <laughs> It allowed me to travel <laughs> freely for, for a year, but a path that I thought I would be taking after that year, I diverged from that in, entirely. But it, it, what it told me was that there was no way that I could sit there for the rest of my life and be a reservations agent for a cruise line. Exactly. I worked as a corporate paralegal on the corporate side as opposed to litigation and I knew that I never wanted to work in corporate law <laughs> it was not for me but it was a great you know it's exactly right you you you're, you learn from your experiences and what you love but also what you you don't love I think also I agree with you too um, I took a year as well from college to grad school and I think in that time besides having about 10 jobs um, <laughs> You know, I really did learn, oh, I don't want to, you know, be a traditional actor and go job to job to job. I have to figure out another way because I told myself I'm smarter than this. You know, I have all these other things that I want to do. I can't see myself, you know, rehearsing six, seven hours a day, making $300 a week, which many actors make in New York. And this is, I don't know how they live, but this is what they do. So I realized that quickly. But I think for any, you know, any program you want to go into, the difference of going to, I think, you know, being an undergrad versus a graduate degree, you really, when you go to graduate school, when you know you want to be there, you get more out of it. I don't want to say, you know, college is just everyone does it, but graduate school is a choice. I think you want to be there. Every single person in my program wanted to be there. It wasn't like a lot of times parents push us to, you know, go to a certain school or, you know, just go to college. You figure it out later. But a, a graduate degree, a master's, a PhD, you want to be there. And you want to take advantage of all the opportunities there. So take some time, a year, two, three years, travel. May, you may change your mind. You know, you may, I, I actually meet a lot of lawyers who are now actors, <laughs> which is incredible, or even athletes, you know, athletes who are now, you know, in the entertainment industry, are directors and producers, which um, I think there are those connections, you know, which sometimes you don't figure out until you get some time to breathe in that space. They're called recovering lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> They're recovering. We haven't really recovered yet. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, my question is about um, learning different or new languages. I know that Sharon, Michelle, and Amy, you all spoke about um, learning different literatures for different languages. What did you to learn a new language? Um, and what made you choose the languages you learned? Um, so in, in Jamaica, I didn't... We didn't have a choice. We had four foreign languages we had to learn. And fortunately for me, I love foreign languages. I discovered that when I was age 10. Um, and so, uh, you know, there, certain people adapt very quickly. They learn languages very quickly. Others, it's not a strength. And so it all depends on, on the person. But I... But <laughs> Now that I think about it, you know, studying languages really sort of led very indirectly to what I'm, I'm doing now because what it, not only studying the language, but studying the literature, the culture behind it, the norms, um, what, what makes a population or a culture very different from yours are all critical to, to understanding 
that group. So the, the, the language is very rich, but there's a lot of other stuff around it that should accompany the actual study of the language. Personal, but it actually ended up governing a good part of my career. Um, in the, there's a little more to it, but in the mid '90s, I was at Cornell, and everybody had an identity. I think it was the moment of identity <laughs> memoirs, and mm -hmm. everybody there was a Latino, and there were gay, there was, ever, and I didn't have one. I thought, but I did have a grandmother who was um, a Sephardic from Turkey, and they spoke Ladino. They spoke a kind of Spanish, but I became gripped by sort of assuming and learning this identity. And then I became gripped by the Ottoman Empire and then the Islamic empires, and then I had to go learn Arabic. So I did. I think we have one, two. I, I would say if you can't find passion in, in what you're doing in your career, try volunteering in an area where you, you think that passion can be uh, fruitful for you so to maintain that passion because you don't want to become disillusioned. I love your question because it actually points to something that we don't really get to talk about, which is that some of work is work. Um, and that there's probably a lot of things that all of us do on some regular basis mm -hmm. to get to go do the other stuff. That's great. And one of the things that's nice about our times is that people put together their lives in very different ways and find satisfaction in different ways, which is maybe not a full answer, but it is a realistic one. The way that I dealt with it was by continuing to go to school um, until the last possible moment. <laughs> and I realized I was not going to get another thing. Um, and I'm not sure that, that I was working anyway, and others were professionalizing along the way, which I didn't fully grasp. Um, so there are so many ways to put together a satisfying life. It is, it is a tough transition. I remember when I first started working at a law firm um, after law school, it was the very first time for me personally where I didn't have a break uh, at the next semester and a change of classes and a turning over of new, of new material. It was just my career straight out in front of me with no end, you know, and, 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 and it's hard to figure out where the breaks are and um, and one of the things I would I would say is uh, we Americans don't take our vacations um, and and we are a very highly driven society and I think I, I saw a statistic that like how many millions of vacation days every year that aren't used take vacation days um, and really try to uh, try to get those breaks in and I think it's important for for mental and emotional health to really take time away from from work. The only other thing I'd, I'd add to, to what everyone said is is building community um, and, and, and trying to, to find opportunities to do that w w within your job as well as outside of your job. You know, on the disillusionment side, um, when I came to DC and I worked for a law firm, I remember thinking it was the neatest thing in the world. I couldn't believe it. Maybe it's a known thing with um, when folks are studying law that that a law firm, at least the firm I was with, provides you with uh, the clothes you can wear to the gym, and the gym is in the building, 
And, you know, if you stay past a certain time, you can choose dinner from wherever you would like. And I remember thinking for the first several mm, couple of months, that was really awesome <laughs> until I realized <laughs> the reason behind that is because you're there a lot. All the time. <laughs> All the time. And, um, and I did. I, I had those moments where I would just think, just like you said, my goodness, I'm, this is it. You know, and give you everything you need to live without ever having to leave the building. You never have to leave the building. You go in at <laughs> it's eight. It's really scary. And you come out like at eleven at night. <laughs> if, um, at all. if at all. So it's true. So day. I started to think about how could I build community within this building because I couldn't find my way out of it. And by the time I got out of it, most of the people that I did know in DC, which were different from my New York community were either like way past a second glass of something or in bed, you know, um, and, and I, I really, I can't, and if you can't figure out how to build community, ask. I think people like us, part of why we're so chatty tonight, and y'all humor me on this, is everyone likes to be asked about what they do and why they're doing it. And even if that's where you start in building community in your office, is maybe finding that person who may be the least likely to engage with you or that you might want to engage with. But sit down with them and ask them to talk about themselves and share their story with you. But you also realistically, if I, if I may add, think about what that passion means. Mm -hmm. right? Because your, your passion isn't necessarily another person's passion, and if you're projecting onto that person what that passion is, there will, by definition, be disillusionment because there will be a disconnect. So, so try to keep that passion checked. Uh, I, I'm not saying not to have it, but just to be cognizant and be fully aware of what it is that you're feeling. What is it that you want? What are you looking for? Those are the questions that you, you need to ask because passion isn't everything. I mean, there's a lot of hard work that's been needed, depend, depending on what that passion is, but um, it's, it's harder work than, than it would first appear. Also, I just want to add, um, you will be disillusioned, and <laughs> I'm just saying, oh, disappointed. you know, and disappointed, disappointed and disillusioned to a certain extent, and it depends on what you do with that disappointment. Um, I think one thing that a lot of schools or professors, you know, they don't have time to. They don't have time to tell you, you know, when you get out, you may not land your dream job. And you may end up, you know, with a master's degree babysitting, which was one of my jobs. You may be a waiter. You may be, you know, a yoga <laughs> instructor or clean floors. These are all things that I did a bartender, you know, all types of things. But I never stayed in that space. Those are just things that I had to do to pay the bills. And I think that community, you know, what she said is very important. Surrounding yourself with the people that, you know, you want to work with and being active. When we're in school, you know, we have the structure there for us that tells us go to class, be here, be there, this fellowship, this opportunity. But when you get out, part of sometimes the disappointment is, is that you're not doing enough. You don't necessarily have a mentor there, which I think, you know, I'm probably the youngest person up here, but I would say that that's something that I've struggled with. I wish I had you know, a mentor, and I'm almost, I'm 29. I wish I had a mentor. I'm still so looking. <laughs> I'm still looking for, you know, someone that can lead me through the ropes because I don't know everything. I'm still trying to figure it out. So definitely, I went through that experience, you know. Okay, I'm out. Freedom. What do I do? And it's, it's up to you. You have to be the one that looks for the fellowships, that looks for the next opportunity. You know, your professors aren't going to do that. Your schools aren't going to do that when you get out. They may have great alumni events or things where you can come back and connect, but you know you go to school so you can have that foundation where you feel confident enough that yeah, you know when I step you know on, onto into an audition, I know how to hit it on stage and on 
you know, on screen, and I know how to teach, and I know how to do this. You know, you have that confidence because you have, you have the background, but you have to be the one to, to push yourself out there. Well, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for questions. Uh, big thank you again to our speakers. Thank you. And uh, there will be a reception hosted outside if you want to come down and ask questions. However, I know that some of you have class at it right now.